Giving honor to God, our creator, our redeemer, and our provider. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And we love our neighbors as ourselves as we give honor to our spiritual guides, to our illuminated Supreme Mother, Mildred Davis Miller, to His Holiness of Blessed Memory, Master Malvin Davis, to our Supreme Father, Marshall Davis, and our Supreme Mother, Aletha Ravina Davis Drake, to all the saints and loved ones of the Spiritual Guidance Temple of Truth, to the people of all nations, to all living creatures, and to all material manifestations, I greet you with Hotep. Shalom. Peace. Abide. For our scripture, I'll read the Or you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight is like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, but by evening, it is dry and withered. You are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our inequities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and they fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath as a, is as great as the fear that is, in your, that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent O oh Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad of our days. We may be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have been troubled. May our deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I've read the 90th Psalm in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Blessed Mother. Amen, amen, amen. Let us stand and repeat the Lord's Prayer in unison. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks be to God for his gift of riches. Thanks be to God for his gifts of joy. Thanks be to God for his gifts of health. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Okay, and our song is, We Praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of Light. Amen. 
pray. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us Thy goodness and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Okay, then, uh, please set up a break for our meditation. That's crazy now. Um, but our meditation. Trouble with the computer for a minute here. Okay. Our meditation is because of you. So please. Sit for a moment, relax yourself. Remember the best way to relax is first tense your body and then relax. Breathe in through your nose, out through the mouth, into the nose again, out through the mouth. And one last time, into the nose, and out to the mouth. Now repeat after me. O oh Lord, God Almighty, I am your child. As your child, I realize I live because of you. There is strength in my body because of you. There is glory in my soul because of you. There is abundance in me and all around me because of you. Awaken me, cleanse me, transform me, free me from the limitations of this world and lift my consciousness and to the everlasting joy that is because of you. Because of you, goodness, mercy, prosperity, and health are here to comfort me. I give you thanks for your eternal blessings. Amen. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to do our meditation mountain here. And we know the meditation mountain, which you should remember that it has three stages, stages, the stage of concentration, the stage of meditation, and the stage of prayer. Uh, as was mentioned to us or taught to us, by our illuminated Supreme Mother Mildred Davis Miller. And in the stage of concentration, what you want to do is you want to pick a point or some place to concentrate on, some, find something sacred. It can be a candle, or it can be a Bible, it can be just a symbol. But we're going to use that to concentrate on that. And at each count, we're going to like repaint or reconfigure that uh, point uh, as a sacred point in our mind. To the count of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then a stage of meditation, we want to use our imagination to imagine energy flowing into that point from God and then 
you being showered with those blessings that are being poured into that point. And with each count, you'll see a renewed flow of energy into that point and a radiance to you from that point to the count of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And for the last stage, close your eyes and imagine that you are that point in which God's blessings flow into you and radiate from you. And at each count, imagine another flow of that joy, that health, that strength from God flowing into you and then becoming a light that flows out to all the world to the count of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that ends our devotion. Thank you very much for being with us. And as a, uh, then for our lesson today, I call it Palm Sunday and Hosanna, the victorious shout for salvation. And this comes from the 151st chapter of the Quran Gospel. Earlier, uh, Teresa reminded me that if you don't have your Quran Gospel, that you can go on our website. There's a uh, which is www.spiritualguidancetemple.org. And on the website, there's a, um, on the banner part, there's a section that you can go to called resources. And one of the resources that you can pull up is the Quran Gospel. And once you get that Quran Gospel up, it has links to each one of the chapters. So you can go, and the chapter you want to go to is the 151 chapter, 151st chapter. Uh, of the Quran Gospel, so you can be able to find and read along with you today or in another time that you want to go over it. But on that website, you do have access to um, an online version of the Quran Gospel with all of its chapters. And the one we're looking at, uh, the main verse that we're going to be looking at in this 151st chapter is uh, the 27th verse. And then it says, the temple and the temple courts were filled with children praising, praising God. They said, Hosanna to the king. The son of David is the king. All hail the king. Praise God. So today we're going to be talking about the significance of that. Because this is a day when they are recognizing Jesus as the true king of the Jews. All of the other times, that, and for me to think about this, that means that all the other times that Jesus had actually come into the city and talked to people, he had not fully acknowledged the fact that he was the true king. Because remember, it's saying he was the son of David, is king. Jesus was born under the bloodline or heritage of David. And they can trace his bloodline from David's family, both on his mother's, side and his father's side uh they're like they're in and in, uh, and i think it's in matthew and one of the other gospels they give a uh, heritage of jesus and there's a little difference in each one and the little difference in it is that one pla- traces the bloodline of mary to this to david and the other one traces the bloodline of joseph to david but as to show that Jesus was in the bloodline that was to be the king of Judah. So that means that by birth, he should have been king. But we know at the time when he was alive that the Jews were under the control of the Romans. And the Romans had picked someone that they wanted to be beholding to them as the king of the Jews. So Herod was not the king based on Jewish tradition. He was king based on Roman rule. So the real king of the Jews would have been Jesus. 
he was of that bloodline he that should have fallen on him just like you know when we look at the royal families now and it passed down from a generation to generation that is what we find in Jesus and why he can have this triumphant entry into Jerusalem to declare that um, I am your king. And here we see in this 27th chapter, uh, 27th, the, the 151st chapter of the Quran Gospel in the 27th verse, we hear even the children praising God for the fact that God established a king for them and Jesus was a descendant of that king so they would praise him as being that king and praising that um, uh, safe salvation to come through them through his king. And when we look at the word Hosanna, you'll see why I'm saying salvation. In fact, let's go to that now, I think. So if we look at the word Hosanna, of what they were saying is Hosanna is what they were crying out. And Hosanna is basically translated as save, we pray or save us, we pray. Hosanna comes from, uh, is even though it is here uh, a, shown as a Greek word uh, in the in Strong's numbering system, it would be the Greek word 5,614 is Hosanna. But it is a transliteration of a Hebrew word, Hosanna. And Hosanna from the Greek means save us now, or please save, <clears throat> uh, showing that the na suffix in, in Hebrew expresses something that it shows an intense emotion. So there are actually two Hebrew words that this transliteration comes from. So it says the two words it comes from is yasha uh, and na, meaning save now, like yasha, like even Jesus' name is Yahshua, which is from the same root of Yasha. Uh, his name means saver, savior. And, but in this case, they were using it as uh, translating, remember the word from, from Hebrew would have been Yashana, Yashana, uh, uh, to mean save us now, which is very close to Jesus' name uh, in the Hebrew. Remember in Hebrew, his name was Yahshua. Uh, which it also has that title of sa salvation in it. So Hosanna is a way of saying, uh, saying it, but it has that, because it has that na at the end of it, that is a suffix. That is something that in the Hebrew language, they would add to a word to show that you wanted to do it with an intense motion. That means that you were doing it with, um, uh, as we've been talking about it, our true emotions should come from our soul. So it's saying that this is something that you should be shouting from the home of your soul, as mother would say. Something that you would be calling out loud from the home of your soul to have that true feeling behind it. And because emotion, to, to do the true emotion that comes from the soul, it is not always like the emotion that people have. We many times we would like to try to fake motion by just being loud or we fake it by showing anger and we believe that that shows the intensity of it. But the soul doesn't need the loudness. I mean, it can have the loudness, but the soul doesn't need the loudness, but its soul is something deep within you that you can feel it stirring up within you, stirring up that spiritual energy, stirring up that uh, gusto in you, stirring up all of your uh, luster that within you. It's like stirring up a light within you, stirring up an energy within you when you're saying something with an intense emotion. Because we want to have the right type of intense emotion. We don't wish one emotion that is uh, uh, often just a fake emotion. Because, you know, people will uh, fake emotion and they'll make you think that uh, because they're doing it, you know, and they're sweating and they're doing other things. Uh, and not to say that some of the people not sweating, they don't have intense emotion from the soul, but there's some who will try to fool you with that same type 
of emotions. The thing about emotions coming from the soul that I find for me that they're different than just the emotions that you see from many people. Because many times people, uh, because you can have, uh, be fearful, you can be doubtful, and people will see that as emotional. They are, they're really what they're doing is they're being erratic. And erratic, I think, actually comes from the mind putting all of these unnecessary uh, tap, uh, tapestry on your emotions. But for to get that true spiritual feeling from it, you have to actually actually get in contact with your soul within you and let your soul, uh, like it says, um, bless the Lord, O my soul, in all that is in me. It's saying go all the way into that soul so it can feel its connection to universal concepts as it says things like Hosanna. You know, just have that uh, have it where uh, it's just coming from that deep soul desire within you, that deep soul feeling within you that you can feel the spiritual nature of that Hosanna being said. So um, any, any comments or questions so far? So as we're going to read through this, again, the 151st chapter of the Korean Gospel, which I'll remind you is available on our website under the resources tab. So there are several screens. I'm going to read the first one, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. It was the first day before the Sabbath day, the eighth day of the Jewish Nisan month, that Jesus came to Bethany. And on the Sabbath day, he went up to the synagogue and taught. And on the morning of the first day of the week, the Sunday of the week, he called his 12 apostles unto him and said, This day we go up to Jerusalem. Be not afraid. My time has not yet come. Now two of you may go into a village of, Beth, of Bethphage, and you will find an ass tied to a tree, and you will see a little coat nearby. Untie the ass and bring her here to me. If anyone inquires why you take the ass, just say, the master has need of her, and then the owner will come on with you. And the disciples went as Jesus bid them go, they found the ass and coat near an open door. And when they would untie the ass, the owner said, why would you take the ass away? And the disciple said, the master has a need of her. And then the owner said, tis well. And then they bought the animal and, her, and on her put coats. And Jesus sat upon the ass and rode into Jerusalem. So here we have Jesus, but he's warning his, uh, Jesus already knew what was going to happen when he was going to make this claim. But he let his disciples know is, this is not the day when that ruckus is going to happen. So don't be afraid now, but I'm about to challenge the system of government that is being inflicted upon my people. You know, we often, often talk about Moses saying, let my people go. But this is almost Jesus' opportunity of saying that he is about to declare that he should be the leader of his people. Just as Moses went uh, before Pharaoh and told him, and remember when I was talking about Moses, um, uh, Moses did a little different because what Moses actually asked Pharaoh was to let his people go into the three miles, a three days march or something like that into the wilderness and praise God there. And not actually telling Pharaoh that he was planning to leave totally, but that he was just going to take them out a distance and they were going to pray to God there. And then through many wondrous acts, try to show Pharaoh uh, why it was actually beneficial for him uh, to let them pray to God and, and, and invoke God's power uh, in their life. But here Jesus is, you know, after being there for a while and after teaching for uh, several years, he thought now it is time to actually to claim my rightful place 
even though I know in claiming that praise, place, it's going to stir up some political uproar. It's going to make people sit up and think about what they're doing, think about who's being leading him, leading them, and especially think. And I think that's what was kind of confused a lot of people uh, as we get deeper into it is they were speak, expecting this leadership was going to just come up against the Romans. They thought that when he, uh, what he was saying would be something that he would challenge the Romans. You'll find later that that's what the Jews are going to try to charge him with, is that he is defying the Romans. But when we get to this end of this chapter, Jesus didn't go to the Roman government hall. He went and protested at the temple because the temple was actually the center to him of the Jewish people, not where they were going as a government. And from the scriptures, he knew that the king was to come into the Jerusalem as a city on a, a, a donkey or, a, or as it says here, an ass. So he already had an image of how he could come and show to the people that he was the rightful king. Because, you know, he never shouted out, I'm the king, but his mere act of riding in on this ass or this donkey was enough for the people to know through their traditions that he was claiming the rightful place as king of the Jews. And at this first showing of this, as we read, we'll find out that the people were so elated about it, even in here. Um, uh, well, let's go let, let's go on further, because now we just have his disciples who are putting their coats on the animal for him to sit on, and then him riding into Jerusalem on this donkey. So let's go to the next section. So we're at the going to the 10th to the 17th verse. I'll read it and we'll come back and talk. And multitudes of people came and filled the way. And his disciple praised the Lord and said, Christ blessed is the king who in the name of God is come. All glory be to God and peace on earth. Goodwill to men. And many spread their garments in the way. And some tore branches from the trees and cast them in the way. And many children came with garlands of sweet flowers and placed them on the Lord, all, 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 all shown them, all shout, drove them in the way and said, all hail the king, long live the king. The throne of David has been built again. Hosanna to the Lord of hosts. Hosanna to the Lord of hosts. Among the throngs of Pharisees who said to Jesus as he passed, rebuke this Nazi throne, throne. It is a shame for them to cry thus in the streets. The Lord replied, I tell you, men, if these should hold their peace, the very stones would cry, cry aloud. And then the Pharisees conferred among themselves. They said, our threats are idle words. Behold, hold for all the world is following him. So in this section, we actually see as Jesus come before the multitudes, because every, all up until now, it's been his disciples that he's been conferring with and riding into Jerusalem. But then as they get to the multitudes, even the disciples begin to say, praise the Lord. And they said that he should be thrice blessed who came in the name of God. So it's saying that Jesus actually has his power and authority from God. Uh, and I think when they're saying thrice blessed, the wonderful thing about, uh, about Jesus at his time is Jesus was a king. Jesus was a prophet. And Jesus 
was a healer. He was all those things. Because sometimes you don't find all those qualities in the same person. You don't find a person who is both the leader, the one who can receive the word directly from God as the prophet, and the one that actually does the healer. Those may, you know, you may have, you know, when you have an uh, uh, organization or a group, those may be three entirely different people. The king is not necessarily the one that can prophesy to you, or the king is not the one who actually does the healing. The king is just there to, as to do some administrative things, but here it is saying that, his type is saying that he is thrice blessed because he's a king that actually comes to them directly from God. So it says, all glory be to who? To God, who brings this king who can bring peace on earth and goodwill to men. And disciples began, uh, um, and said, and many, as the, as the multitude saw the disciples claiming this position, that this, kind of, this is a king that has thrice blessings on him. They began to spread their garments on the way. And they began to, after they didn't have enough garments to fill up the way, I think, they actually started getting the branches off of trees and laying them down before him to show that this was a holy path that he was taking. This is a path blessed by God. And because he said, even the children went and did garlands of flowers, of sweet flowers, and placed them on the Lord. That means they would take flowers uh, and put them on him, on his person, to actually show that they were blessed. And as they began to talk about the throne of David has been built again. And remember, that's why I said the throne of David. What had stopped the throne of David? When the Romans took over. They stop taking uh, or assigning kings over the Jews from the, the royal bloodline of David. And they will get anybody that will follow their rules, like Herod or some other person, to be their administrator and to rule over the people the way the Romans wanted to rule over them, which is not from the words of God. So it was saying that, and Jesus coming in, we know that he is from that holy family, that he will bring up, build up the same reign that David had started and that we wanted him to be our king, our savior, as he called him, Hosanna. As we're saying, Hosanna, because remember that means save us, that we want to be saved from this way that we're living now by the true king, by the true Lord of hosts, that he would be over to, to be over the host of angels, the host of the military, all the hosts, that he would be the Lord of us all. But then as the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, even though they were um, strict traditionalists and probably knew some of these traditions, they knew that they were, they knew for a long time they had been the ones who accepted the Roman control. They knew that by what they thought that Jesus was going to be going against the Roman control, that he needed to, oh, don't let them say that. Especially so, you know, don't let them shout that in the streets. That is a shame to do that. And it's a shame because what? We don't want to get the Romans upset with us. Because we have accepted their power. We accepted their rule. We've even accepted the affliction they're putting on our people. So you need to tell the people to stop making it such. And uh, I don't know if they were just saying, don't make it so loud. They probably would have, if he came with a sneak attack, they probably would have been fine with that if he thought he was going to do a sneak attack against the Romans. But don't come in there with all this throne of people making all this noise while you're doing that. And Jesus told him that if the people weren't shouting, what? The earth, the stones around them would do what? Would cry out aloud. In other words, you know, you say, 
It ain't no secret because it what? Done been told. So Jesus is saying, if you stopping the people are not going to stop this process from happening. Because this is something that comes from God. So the Pharisees had to go among themselves and say, how, what are we going to do? Because I, the way that we're threatening him, that this is going to be dangerous for him, nobody is listening to it. And all the world, every, everybody seems to be what? Because I'm becoming all the world, because he's even saying the stones, that means the whole earth, everything around him is doing what? Is following him. Is following what he's saying. That we had a, uh, a, a tradition of who should be our king, and that tradition was passed, given to us by God. We have not been following it, and here he is going to try to bring up that type of rule again. But they decided this was not the time because all the people, all the world seemed to them to be supporting Jesus. So now on the next screen, we'll go from the 18th to the 25th verse, and I'll read it, and then we'll go back and talk about it. As Jesus drew near Jerusalem, he paused and wept and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the holy city of the Jews. Yours was the glory of God, but you have cast the Lord away. Your eyes are closed and you cannot see the king. The kingdom of the Lord of heaven and earth has come. You comprehend it not. Hold the day will come when armies from afar will cast a bank about your way, will compass you about, will helm you in on every side will dash you to the ground and slay you and your children in the streets. And of your holy temple and all your places and walls, there will not leave a stone upon a stone because today you spurned the office of the God of heaven. When Jesus and the multitude had come into Jerusalem, excitement reigned and people asked, who is this man? The multiplied multitude replied, this is the king, the prophet, the priest of God. This is the man from Galilee. But Jesus tarried not. He went directly to the temple porch, and it was filled with people pressing hard to see the king. So it starts off with Jesus just before he gets into the city itself. He actually pauses for a while and does what? And cries. Because he's already foreseen that this city that was started by God, this holy city that was supposed to be a place that, well, because when God first made an arrangement with the Jews, he told them they were going to be his example to the world and how to live their lives. But a part of being that example of, of mankind on how to live their lives. If you go back into the, uh, into the Bible when he was giving it the, the, his recitations to the people, uh, before he even gave both to the Bible, he told them that, uh, he, told them uh, about, he told them about both blessings and woes. He said, I'm giving you some rules that if you live by those rules, you will find what? Blessings. But if you do these other things, you're going to get what? Woes. So he was saying with all nations, as an example, I want to show you how spiritual principles work. Spiritual principles can do what? Bring you blessings or they can bring you woes. And you get to decide which one you're going to be under. The part where you receive the blessings or be defiant and do the woes. And Jesus was hurt when he was coming into the city because he knows of this great opportunity that had been given to the Jews, and they did what? They squandered it. They did the things that would give them monetary blessings, but on the side, they would still do what? 
all the dirty, nasty things that they were warned not to do. The thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill, thou shall not do those other things. They would go through the rituals that would bring in prosperity and uh, wealth. But it came to the other rules, they were always just what? They wanted to just bring, break the rule and then bring in sacrifices to try to amend for doing wrong over and over again. And even though you may get mercy because you come and do a sacrifice, God is not fooled. God is not mocked. God knows in your heart, even though he gives you more time through the sacrifice that you bring, that he's just not, he knows that if you keep doing over and over and over again, that you have never done it what? In sincerity. And so that's why when Jesus actually looked at Jerusalem that he was going to go into, he knew that his people had failed. He knew that Jerusalem, which was a holy city, had cast God to the side. And that even on this day, when God was giving him another opportunity to do it, he already figured that they were rejecting him as king in the, se in the sense that God had made them a king, in the sense of helping to rule over their spiritual life more so than just their physical lives. In this 19th verse, it says, you have, you, your eyes are closed and you cannot see the king the kingdom of the Lord of heaven and earth has come. You comprehend it not. You don't even comprehend well what it means. You would just have me to try to give you material things and still not hold you to the laws that God gave you in the first place that you were supposed to have a spiritual relationship that develop a kind of government and a kind of interaction among people that did not believe in having to kill, steal, lie, cheat, and covet each other. You have not lived up to that part of it. And that is the more important part of it than you just doing the rituals that will help to bring you in material blessings. Like sometimes we'll get so caught up, you know, and because even now with religion, a lot of it says, uh, uh, and this is part of, I think it's the Lutheran or whatever the Protestants use now, that if you... Uh, get riches, that that shows that God has blessed you. No matter what you've done to get those riches, that means that God selected you because you get riches. And somehow they twisted the words of the Bible to, to, to try to make that seem justifiable. When God would even tell them things like, you know, the wicked may flourish, but they will perish. Telling them that giving physical and material wealth and things don't show that you are spiritually blessed. But the way they have set it up, you'd make, you would think that if you get, if you're the one who ends up with it, that means that that's the way God wanted it. And that's the way God ordained it to be. And that's how they, one of the ways they chiss it up. They believe that everything is decided and ordained by God, not as what God has showed us an example, that you make the decision on whether you want to get the blessings or the woes, that that's not God's decision. That's on the hearts and minds of what? The people. But they try to make it seem that if you get blessed, that means that is what was ordained by God. And therefore, no matter what you've done to get the blessing, you can say, oh, I am blessed because I got the material thing out of it. That is not from God. God says that you have a choice on how to live. And I want to even use the Jews to show people how this choice works. It's just like uh, my wife and I were talking about something else. I was just talking about energy. God gives you like energy. Or he gives you like fuel. But the question is, how do you use that fuel? You can take fuel and use it to go to your enemy or people that you don't like and burn down their stuff, right? 
But you could have used that same fuel to go out and make a food for a feast for people. How do you use the fuel? How do you use the blessings that God gives to you? And the answer on what is going to return to you is based on what choices you make. To me, that is the choice that he gave the Jews all the way at the beginning. Um, and I'm talking about the whole 12 tribes as he made them the example people. He gave them the choice of, of showing them to be an example to others that there are blessings and there are woes. And it depends on how you react, how you develop, whether you get the blessings or whether you get the woes. And even though Jesus knew that this is an opportunity that the Jews could have used to help to get them back into that good groove where they would get blessing upon blessing that so often he had seen from them of way they did with Moses, the way they did with, uh, uh, against David, and the things they did all over uh, to end up being entrapped by the Romans and before them, the Babylonians, that he didn't believe that they were going to continue in the blessings. He could see that they were headed on a pathway to the what? That they had cast God aside. They had cast the Lord aside so that they were going to end up with the whole city being destroyed and not a brick being left over. As even said in 27, it says, and your holy temple and your palaces and walls, they will not leave a stone upon a stone because today you spurn the offers of the God of heaven. So God was offering them another opportunity by sending Jesus to them as the king. And they had an inkling of knowledge because it says in the 21st verse, and the multiples replied, this is the king, the prophet, and the priest of God. This is the king, the prophet, and the priest. I've talked about it early, that Jesus was all three wrapped up in one. He was the king, which is a uh, administrative leader. He was the prophet, the one who could actually bring them the word of God. And he was the priest who was a healer. Pre many times when they would talk about someone being healed, they would take them for the priest. So the priests were considered the ones who uh, uh, had the healing knowledge and the knowledge to be able to bless you. So Jesus had all three. He was all three of them. The king, the prophet, and the priest of God even though he was a man from a small town called Galilee. But as they came, and uh, I really think that they thought that he was going to head to some place so he, to, as a king, that he would go to some hallway where, you know, he would just set up a king and have people come and uh, give him uh, money and things like that as a king. Where did Jesus go? Because I mean, he could just stand in the midst of those people and they would start deciding of, of putting how their armies are going to work for them, how their uh, soldiers were going to protect him and do all these things. But he did not go to the administrative offices. He went where? It says in the 25th verse, he tarried not. He went directly to the temple porch. Directly to where? The temple porch, which was the sacred place where they were, to, and remember at the temple, for them, since they had the Ark of the Covenant, they had the mercy seat. This is the place where God was supposed to be able to, to con connect. So Jesus didn't want to go and see where you put your administrative offices. He's saying, I want to go to see how you are interacting with who? With God. Not how what your soldiers can produce, not what your uh, uh, men of power can produce, not what your administrators, not what your tax collectors, 
not with uh, uh, you know your way you're doing, you, how you're handling businesses and business transactions. I want to come see how you are handling your relationship with God. That is what the Christ wants to see. And we have to ask ourselves the same thing. You know, a lot of times that we want to see how well we're doing, you know what we look at? Not just yourself. You look at your bank account. <laughs> huh? You said self. I say a lot of times when people want to check out how they're doing, they look at their bank account. They look at how much money is in their pocket. They look at, you know, what's in, how much food they have in the refrigerator. But do you ever check to think, what is my relationship to God? How am I interacting with God? Do I feel that intense joy? Yes, you, we are called, you know, because a lot of times when we're calling Hosanna, what we're talking about, we're thinking about, oh, this, how, what impact this is going to have on my cash flow. What is the impact it's going to have on even my, you know, sometimes you say my body and my physical health. We we'll think about all those things and not think of how is this going to have help to awaken your soul and its relationship with God. So the first thing Jesus wanted to say, let's go to the temple and let's see. And even people, and since he was going to the temple, people went there. They were pressing hard to go to see the king. They went to the temple and they filled it up with people who wants to see this king. So in the 26th verse, and I'm going to read the last screen from this. The sick, the halt, the lame, the blind were there. And Jesus paused and laid his hands on them and healed them with the sacred word. The temple and the temple courts were filled with children praising God. They said, Hosanna to the king. The son of David is the king. All hail the king. Praise God. The Pharisees were filled with anger when they heard the children sing. They said to Jesus, hear you what the children say? And Jesus said, I hear. But you have never read, but have you ever read the words of your own bard who said, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. And when the evening came, the Lord and his disciples went again to Bethany. So the place that Jesus felt as the king that he could do the most good is in doing what? Helping the sick, the halt, the lame, and the blind. That's what he felt because he would lay his hands on them and he would use his sacred word to be able to do what? To heal them. And because they saw him actually doing this healing, even the children started doing what? Praising God and saying, what? Save us now. And we know you have this healing power. Give us that spiritual uh, blessing that you are giving out here at the temple. So this is a king who the first act he was actually doing was actually doing what? Work to help the people. Because most kings, the first thing they want to set up is how I'm going to get paid. How are y'all going to turn over all your stuff to me? Where are y'all going to put my throne? Jesus didn't look for a throne to sit on. He went to the temple and there, when he saw people that were in need, he was giving to him. You know, when I was doing some studying, this, uh, uh, when you look at the word king in most languages, it often talks about this power and authority uh, to rule over people. Um, even when they, uh, and, you know, when I was studying Egyptian, uh, a lot of times you see uh, Egyptians, you'll see them holding a, um, what they call a hook and a flail in their hands. And the hook and a flail. Hook kind of looks like a little a shepherd's 
question mark hook. You look like a question mark to be able to hook things. And the flail is uh, it's like a whip. And when you study Egypt's, uh, Egyptology, they will tell you that these were symbol of power and authority. That that's why the Egyptians chose them. That because the, the two things were things that they could use to, to rein people in with the hook and to beat them with the, with, the, with the whip, the flail. Until I started looking at deeper and deeper into some uh, African Afrocentric interpretations of the Pharaoh, and they said that that was a misconception, that this was uh, some kind of thing to, uh, to force people to follow you, uh, either through hooking you up or through um, or through uh, uh, beating you with, the, with, the, with that whip. And they said the hook actually showed that the Pharaoh understood the duties of a shepherd. Because, you know, a shepherd actually used his hook to actually save the sheep from dangerous situations. He don't just do it to make the sheep. He has dogs to keep the sheep together if they're not in a dangerous spot. So he does not, a shepherd does not use his hook to keep his sheep following. Sheep follow their leader. And you can just put sheep dogs around them and do what? And keep them herd together. So you don't need a hook for that. What you need a hook for is sometime a sheep might fall over um, a cliff or something or be in someplace dangerous. And you can use the hook to do what? To lift them out. A shepherd also uses his hook because it's a staff. It's really a staff. He also uses it to protect the sheep against certain animals. To beat the enemies away of the sheep. So a shepherd's hook is not a symbol of how he beats the people to keep them in line. It's a symbol of how he can help to save the people and how he can protect the people from harm. And he's saying that's what a hook means to them. And the ship and the and the um, the pharaoh's uh, flail, which it looks like it looks like it is something to whip, but the flail was not something that was used to whip people. A flail was used in agriculture. It was an agricultural tool. So number one shows that he knows how to do. Uh, how to herd animals and protect animals in a herd. And the other one shows his knowledge or abilities over agricultural things. Because in agriculture, a flail is used to separate the wheat from the shaft. When wheat grows, it grows in the shaft of the, of the, uh, of the stalk, right? And to separate the wheat from the shaft, you need something to do what? to beat it out. So his flail was not for him to beat the people. It showed that he knew how to separate the wheat part from the shaft so he understood agriculture. So they're saying that the tools that the Pharaoh had will actually show how he knew how to be a benefit to the people. Not that he knew how to have power and authority over the people, but how he had the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding on how to be able to help his people to prosper. So it showed that there, when you talk to the people who said that they are true descendants, and when I say the true descendants of the, of the Egyptians, most of the people now in Egypt now are uh, from Arab people who have come over from Arabia and have uh, now are in power in that area. But there's still some of the people who said that they are from the ancient descendants of it. And that's how they interpret the, the uh, articles, not those who are actually uh, foreigners now, uh, once were foreigners, and now have taken over the land. So when we look at what is a true leader, in Africa, I was looking at, you know, some of the words they use for a king. 
I've forgotten the exact word uh, that they use, uh, but in several of the African traditions, the name they use for a king and his ruling is the same word they use for, for um, a mother nursing her baby. It has to do with the woman's uh, breast as a, a vehicle for nursing her children. And that's the word they use for a king. So in their concept, a king is actually supposed to be there to what? To nourish the people of that kingdom. To help them to be strong and upright. Just as we see here Jesus as him showing, as it showed his kingship by doing what? By helping the sick, the halt, the lame, and the blind. But the people who want to rule now, they want to make sure that what? Oh, we have the power. And because we have the power, we're going to do things to make sure that we get all the best and you get whatever is left over. And when whatever is left over, y'all going to have to fight for it. We want to be, as, a, as the rulers, we want to be in a position that we have so much money and so, many, so much resources that it doesn't even matter if we make mistakes. And if we make mistakes, we want the whole government to come and bail us out. But anything that we want to give to other people, we're going to say, oh, no, y'all want handouts. When the rich are taking big handouts, And the way they're cheating on with some of the resources you get, they're even cheating you more and more with things. But we want to learn how to be that type of king that Jesus was. And we want to be able to recognize it in the right way that would call out from their very soul to say what? Save us now. Save us from our indecision. Save us from ourselves and let us learn how to accept this deal we have from God that by the way you live your life, you can bring about blessings or you can bring about woe. And at some point in your life, we, I, I would believe that I've said the blessings are better than what? Than the heartaches. I want to be in a part where I can continue to get the blessings. But I've gone through this whole thing and I haven't given anybody else this. Uh... Do we have any other comments? Shalom. Good morning. Can you hear me, Father? I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, it was a great lesson. It was, I was watching the uh, Ten Commandments yesterday. And uh, even though Moses was still telling the people, God is going to allow us to get the harvest. Even though they've seen all these blessings and all these blessings and miracles and the things that Moses was doing, that Moses was doing, they still yet, still yet couldn't find themselves to put themselves in position to receive the blessings, the blessings from the Father. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, uh, it's just like a lot of us today. It's like a lot of us today, but we have to understand. Just because we're not where we was last week or last year, yeah, that's gonna mean that's gonna mean that we are greater than the next. God bless us, not God bless us. We so good and so holy than die so holy that we deserve us. But he does it anyway because he anyway because he blessed he wants to receive the heart. He wants to receive the heart. 
He wants to understand and know that he loves us so much that it's not nothing that he would. It's not nothing for us. So I got, I, I'm just listening. I thank God for the lesson. He's doing a great job bringing the lesson. And thank you. I just give God thanks for this Sunday. God, this Sunday, Sunday, this 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 Sunday, Oh, no, thank you very much. Yes, it's so true. Because I think God wants you to be able to find that glory that can come from your soul. That no matter what the situations you find yourself in life, that that feeling of joy that can come from the whole of your soul, home of your soul is forever there to bless you. No matter what you've done, God still has that love for you and he has that care for you. That it's the type, because remember what Jesus was trying to show is the same type of love that God tries to show for us. That no matter what condition we're in, that God is there to help you, to nurture you, to give you the things that you need to be happy and blessed. And some, yes, sometimes, and, and that's why I say sometimes we're looking at it as being, oh, he always, God has to always sent us the money, or God has to always sent us this power and authority to others. He, he has to be able to give us the strength to beat people up. But God is trying to get joy to your soul. And if you really want to connect up with the blessings of God, you need to connect up with your soul, have that feeling of joy, and realize that joy is there. That beauty is there. That uplifting spirit is there. No matter what you think might be around you, God's joy is there to lift you up. To make you feel that life is worth living. Amen. So no matter what you No, and I was just going to say, Father, and the thing is, we, that joy comes upon you. Know, and I was just going to say, it comes upon you. It seems like it comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. The thing goes, but God, the thing is, the thing. Amen. Because we get caught up in, in, in the things that and it goes on every day. You know, you can be happy today and tomorrow something happens for a second or a minute or even days, you just kind of lose that joy. But you don't lose that connection. Mm -hmm. You still connect to you. You still connected to you. But at the same time, you have to just time. You have to change the press on. And, and, and that's the, the, the song of the, of, the, of the scripture said. Nobody said the road will be easy. But mm -hmm. we know that we know that God is faithful. God he, he faithful. Amen. He has did. He, he has did. He has did. He has did for us. Teresa just remember we were at a, uh, the funeral service and a lady was talking about how no matter what you're going through, God is always there to give you the strength and power to go through it. And when we feel too much of the sadness, it's because we have forgotten, wait a minute, who is helping to back my life? Who is taking me through all these things? Who has the power to actually to see, succeed where I can't succeed? Remember, that's Hosanna means save us now. You need to recognize that what? That we need God's salvation. We need God to take us through. And it's when we start thinking that, oh, we can, you know, we, uh, we can figure it out, we can handle it. 
No, you need God in you and that and, and go and find that joy because you're right. The joy is never your soul never loses that joy. But your mind always is not con uh, connected to your soul. Your mind sometimes tries to take over and tries to figure things out, tries to wonder what's going to happen next. And that's why it says you need to if you dig down deeper than that soul, you find that that soul is working to find you an answer and to bring you happiness and bring you joy and bring you the things that you need to make it through the circumstances in life. Because many of those circumstances are what helps us to grow, what helps us to cultivate. Because God doesn't want you to be here. I know there was a song the man sung in, uh, and I can't totally forget some of the parts of it, but he was talking about, I don't want to, my life to be lived in vain. And if we had a life where um, we never had any problems and nothing ever happened to us, uh, you might be living a life that's what? Just in vain. You're not doing anything with your life and life ain't doing anything with you. And that's not what you really want. You want to, uh, a life that um, you can... I wrote this song down. I can't find it. Oh, here it is. He says, I don't want to run this race in vain. Was the song. Like I said, when I'm old, so I'm going to look it up and see if I can find it again. But I don't want to run this race in vain. And that all times, a lot of times that's what we're doing. We're running the race, but we're vain about it. And if we keep looking to God, keep moving on, keep moving forward, we can find out that your life doesn't have to be in vain. Anyone else have any comments? If not, before we close, I just want to, since we had one of our cousins to pass away, um, I want to just take a moment uh, to a reflection on her life. We had a home going celebration yesterday uh, in North Miami. And her name was Khadidra Antoinette Delavo. Uh, and I want to just take a moment, and I'm going to, as we pray for the release of her soul to be with God, um, then I'm going to read her obituary. It says, on June 18, 1992, in Miami, Florida, God bestowed an ex uh, expressive gift into the lives of Larry Delavo and Sharon Delavo. Her name was Khadidra Antoinette Delavo. She was the only child of this union and the youngest child of Larry Delavo. On March 21st, 2023, Sergeant Khadidra Antoinette Delavo entered, entered eternal rest. Khadidra confessed her love for Christ at an early age with her mother and grandmother, Rovina Drake, at the Spiritual Guidance Temple of Truth. She completed her high school diploma at North Miami Senior High School, class of 2010, after which she joined the United States Army in 2011 and received several accommodations and was honorably discharged. The tenacity and perseverance and courage of life fortified Khadija as a conqueror while she mastered life. Khadija, affectionately known as Sugar or Diva, leads to cherish her irresistible smile and beloved zeal of life with her parents, Larry Delavo, Jackie, and Sharon Delavo, stepmother, Lorraine Ray Shane, brothers, Xavier Delavo, Lavette of Alabama, Kimani Delavo of Houston, Texas, and Kiyomi Sanders of Atlanta, Georgia. Her sister, Dwayne Courtney Willie of Gainesville, Florida, stepbrothers Randy Green of Miami, Florida, and Malcolm Alexander of Oklahoma, stepsister Ariel Block Brock of Miami, Florida, aunts and uncles Loretta Salmon of Miami Gardens, Florida, Phyllis Drake, Melvin Evers, Valerie Robinson, Irvin J. Major Jr., Gwendolyn Hinsden, 
and Barbara Scott of Sarasota, Florida, great aunt Louise Gator of Miramar, Florida, a host of beloved niece, nephews, cousins, relatives, and special friends. So I just wanted to have a memory here. I'm going to put this on the altar for, for a while in remembrance of Khadijah Antoinette Delavo. We ask God to bless her, keep her, and hold her in his heart. Because as I tell people, yes, we love the person, but God loves them more. And her soul will continue even though we do not have her uh, physically to go to anymore. So for our announcements, I want to remind us that our Palm Sunday, this day is Palm Sunday, next Sunday will be Easter. Our Easter baths are for April 7th, 8th, and 9th. Uh, Good Friday is uh, April 7th, and Easter Sunday is April 9th. Um, having here from my, uh, my son's birthday will be on April 11th, and I think Cello has a birthday April 5th, I think. He's, he'll be celebrating an art. Wednesday, celebrating an art, which I think is 40 years old. In fact, we got several people being 40 years old this year. Cello will be 40, Megan will be 40 in June, and my son Matthew will be 40 in um, December. I remember when we were in the temple and all of them, was just, they were just dropping them like they were hot, <laughs> dropping babies like they were hot in whatever year that was, in 1980, would have been 83? 83, there was a lot of babies being born in the temple, and, and now all, they're all reaching 40. So that was uh, Cello, Megan, and Matthew were born in 1983. Uh, and just so you uh, remember that the uh, April 18th is tax day, so taxes are due on April the 18th. It's not usually on the 15th, but this year is April 18th. And that our consecration will be on April the 23rd. So I'd like to thank you for being with us. We took up our collection earlier, so we're thank you for your collection. And remember, uh, you can make donations to us at, from Cash App at the telephone number 954-549-4713, or, uh, and you can use Cash App or Zelle for that number. You can also uh, set up a Zelle account to send it to offerings. That's when they have F, uh, O F F E R I N G S at spiritualguidancetemple.org through Zelle or on our website, which is www.spiritualguidancetemple.org. There is a donate button that goes through PayPal, but you can you don't have to have a PayPal account. You can do it with a check or a credit card through that um, account. So are there any other announcements? Anything I've forgotten? If not, have a pleasant, pleasant Sunday. I mean, um, Palm Sunday, and remember that Hosanna. Remember to try to, as you pray, to try to get a, a, a fervent feeling from deep within your soul that just says, save me now. Say, you know, Hosanna. If you can't say Hosanna, say hallelujah. Hosanna. My wife said it's Hosanna, not Hosanna. Hosanna. So you can feel it, but have, but make sure the feeling comes from within your soul, that you can feel that joy coming up from your soul and helping you to make it in life. And as you said, don't worry, you know, don't, don't fear, don't doubt, just know, say it as if you know that God loves you. That will connect you up to that feeling and say, you know, God loves me. And God will do what? Save me from open. He will take you through all circumstances of life and take you through, as Mother said, because remember we said this is a victorious cry, that God would take you through and make you a conqueror and a more than a conqueror. Because sometimes it's just not enough to be a conqueror. You want to be what? A more than a conqueror. So again, thank you for being with us today. All right, dismissal, let me say, 
May the love of God illuminate your way. May the will of God direct you each day. May the truth of God all errors depart. And may the peace of God forever dwell in your heart. Amen. Amen. Amen.